Welcome to Break the Rules with Dr. Lauren Lax, a podcast dedicated to quieting the noise in the health, food, and fitness world. Dr. Lauren is a leading nutritionist, therapist, and functional medicine practitioner on a mission to help others thrive in their own lives, mind, body, and soul. And now, your host, Dr. Lauren Lax. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the Rake the Rules podcast, where we talk about quieting the noise in the health, food, and fitness world. Today, super pumped to have Dr. Tim Jackson in the house. And Dr. Tim is a doctor of physical therapy who received his undergraduate degree in health science and chemistry from Wake Forest before going on to get his DPT at the Medical University of South Carolina. And he is a fellow functional medicine brother uh, from the allied healthcare space. And after realizing that manual therapy and orthopedic care only helps some of his patients, he began studying functional and environmental medicine as well as digestive health in effort to help them holistically achieve wellness, not just focusing on the physical or the symptoms externally, but helping them also heal internally, which is a big part of my own journey as well in the occupational therapy space. So really pumped to have you on the show, Dr. Tim, and excited to just talk about some of the nuances that you see in um, really the healing journey, specifically digestive healing journey. That's such a wild West. And we're just talking about gut health in general. Most people listening to this podcast are very aware that the gut is the gateway to health. And yet it's just a little bit overwhelming when we say like, okay, just heal the gut and everything else kind of can get better, seemingly gets better. But what does that actually mean? Uh, Because a lot of times people are already eating clean, but not necessarily feeling much better. Um, So excited to to dive in. And I guess we'll kind of just start with your story first and foremost. I always like to get to know you a little bit better. Tell us what really, what catalyzed you to get into this work that you're doing? So I went to undergrad at Wake Forest University, which you mentioned, and uh, took all the pre-med classes, organic chemistry, cellular molecular biology, uh, physics, and I did very well academically. Um, And I was doing preceptorships at the Wake Forest Medical School. And one of the residents pulled me aside and he's like, you know, I can tell you're into working out nutrition and you're not going to get any of that in med school. He's like, I know you can do it academically, but you're going to get frustrated constantly, you know, with what you're being told. And, you know, they never even mentioned nutrition, uh, that sort of thing. And so he said, just get a ticket to play the game, just get a doctorate in some healthcare field. And so, you know, I did that and uh, I always was studying functional medicine, you know, on the side in my free time. And so, you know, when I graduated in 2009, I was able to incorporate, you know, some of the basics of that. And, you know, now there are more DPTs doing that, realizing that a lot of um, orthopedic issues, musculoskeletal issues are due to internal imbalances. Yeah, that's really, I got so frustrated when I was working in the rehab and the pediatric clinics that I loved helping the patients like with the tools that I could, but sometimes it didn't feel like I was actually helping them at all in the long run because a lot of the reasons why, for example, in rehabilitation, uh, a patient may be in there for like a, a a hip or knee replacement was like inflammatory in nature. They were still ordering their like Coca Cola and like French fries on their lunch tray. And it just felt like I was just band-aiding and same thing with a lot of the kiddos. Like they were coming in with ADHD or sensory processing issues or even autism and just feeling like, um, if their, their nutrition was not there, their little guts were not like fully healthy. There's a reason why their the neurochemicals in their brain weren't fully up to speed either. And so I'm Again, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit more about just what you're seeing now in, in practice and helping people holistically. And um, let's kind of like start there, like, like Wild West, gut health in general. Tell us why the gut is important for our health and uh, typical strategies most you see people take to um, make it feel better, heal the gut. Yeah. So, you know, every nutrient with the exception of oxygen has to pass through the gut. And so if the gut is in full, or there's nutrient malabsorption, then uh, you're going to have cellular dysfunction. And so whether that's the cells in your brain, cells in your big toe, 
you're going to have uh, issues. And so, you know, everyone's heard the quote that 70 to 80 percent of your immune health is located in your large intestines. And that's true. Um, but one thing that I see is kind of this, you know, catch all approach. Oh, you have GI discomfort, take probiotics. Um, that may or may not be appropriate. For example, and I know this because I did it to myself, I used to take lactobacillus acidophilus like it was candy. And then I did a stool test and my D lactate levels were off the charts. And D lactate shuts down the mitochondria, which produce energy and causes brain fog. And so, um, you know, the other thing to consider when healing the gut is that uh, probiotic supplementation will not stick to the gut wall if it's continually inflamed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have to work on ways of uh, calming it down uh, naturally with things from glutamine to aloe to the glycerized licorice, um, zinc, L-carnosine, et cetera. At the same time, you know, we have to address any pathogens that are found um, and the biofilm that uh, covers them. And a lot of people, you know, don't address biofilm and it makes, whether you're using prescriptions or nutraceuticals, it makes them much less effective in terms of killing the pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of finding out what's going on with your, your gut, you know, it's extremely important to use a PCR-based uh, stool test because 98% or more of the bugs in the gut are anaerobic. So if you try to culture an anaerobic bug in an aerobic environment, you're going to get a lot of false negatives. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, none of the tests out there are perfect. They all have flaws, but some are a lot more accurate than others. Um, and sometimes you just have to treat empirically. So it's very rare that I see parasites or protozoa come back positive. But if someone still has the symptoms, I just address it empirically and it's usually successful. And talk to us, I guess, just like when you're saying symptoms and address them empirically, what would be symptoms one would feel if they are having uh, some a pathogen of some sort in their, their gut? Yeah, so if it's a parasite um, and it's a worm, you know, those are macroscopic. You can see them when you pass them. Protozoa are microscopic. You can't see them. Symptomatically, you know, let let's say we get your stool test results back, we address the pathogens that were positive, yet you're still having issues. And we worked on healing the gut lining, stress eradication and management, um, but you still have bloating, fatigue, grinding of the teeth at night, uh, things of that nature. And so, you know, using supplements like Mimosa Pudica seed, um, is very helpful. And um, like I said, you know, even in people when it doesn't come back positive, if you're still having discomfort, I think it's a good thing to try. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. How common do you think or have you studied that parasites are in pathogen, in pathogenic infections for folks? Well, pathogenic infections are extremely common. I would say you know, you would be hard pressed to find anyone um, without at least two pathogens mm -hmm. that are either overgrown or just opportunistic bacteria or yeast. Um, and so those are extremely common. Parasites, in my experience, aren't as common as people like to think. Um, I mean, they're still fairly common, you know, even if we live in the United States, but they're not as common as we've been led to believe. And so um, I'd say the most common culprits are things like candida, um, Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, fusobacteria, um, deficiencies in lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. I would say those are the most common imbalances that I see. And low secretory IgA, which protects your mucosal immune system. 
Mm-hmm. How much do you think um, that people are like wrestling with an infection such as that that is contributing to their symptoms or that it's just a matter of insufficiency, like dysbiosis, not enough healthy bacteria? Um, and like, where do you determine how to approach it? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And it depends on, um, you know, the quality of life you want to lead, essentially. So, uh, you know, if you notice a pathogen, uh, whether it's a bacteria or a yeast, um, let's say it's candida, and we go after it and treat it, um, you know, I can't tell people whether it's going to help them reduce their symptoms by 30%, 20%, 40%. But I tell them, no matter what your goal is, we have to optimize the gut. And in terms of, you know, imbalances in the microbiome, that's essentially what allows the opportunistic bacteria and pathogens to gain a foothold. And so, um, you know, like on, I use the GI map diagnostic solutions test a lot. And on there, you know, they will show um, commensal bacteria, but then they'll label it as high if it's overgrown because it's all about, you know, the checks and balances system. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but that's a good point. You know, you can't kill your way to health. And that's a saying I learned from one of my mentors. And, um, you know, if you want to optimize the gut, you got to reestablish the microbiome, which takes time. Yeah, I think it's a huge roadblock we can run into, but both as uh, functional providers, as well as like self-treating and if overuse of like antimicrobial herb agents or just um, things that would kill off the bacteria wherein we actually don't, we need to love the gut versus hate the gut is what I oftentimes will tell my clients. Um, And that just maybe comes more from the population that I see is seeing more insufficiency dysbiosis from like the histories of just trying so many different diets that are quote unquote healthy, but like starving really the bacteria that need those nutrients. And so therefore we just become a more opportunistic host um, and running into roadblocks. I don't know what your thoughts are on like when, when not treating the gut is probably more effective, like from like a kill the pathogens. I'm thinking more in the autoimmune space. Even I've had clients that have like really flared when they, we found maybe SIBO or a pathogen and started down a gut healing path only to find that they end up feeling worse, not better because they're really having a, an autoimmune presentation or a mast cell response more. So. Yeah. So definitely what you just hit the nail on the head with the mast cell response. Um, you know, you never want to kill off more than you can detox. And a lot of times we do that. Of course, we don't know it usually until it's too late. But, um, you know, histamine reactions, prostaglandin reactions, calming those mast cells down first, even though we might know exactly what to do, you know, we need to wait a little bit before we can do it because we have to calm down the body to let it know not everything's a threat. And that gets into the whole psychology of safety and security and the ventral vagal system. Yeah. And I guess just for the listeners, like, how would they know? Like, what what would you say to your even patients? Or how do you proceed Uh, without uh, getting to the point of going too far, too fast? (laughs) Oh, so I would say, well, definitely. uh, I mean, if you, you know, if someone comes to me and tells me, oh, Dr. Tim, I can only eat eight foods then that's a red flag that there's a mast cell reaction. Mm -hmm. Or if, you know, they definitely know they've been exposed to mold. I know their mast cells are going to be active. So we work on calming them down. Um, But it's always a good idea to work on calming down inflammation before you start killing stuff because you're already creating another cytokine storm. And, you know, that's inflammation overload, Uh, not information overload, but inflammation overload. And so, um, yeah, you, you just got to be careful. And I think providing some liver and gallbladder support during the process also goes a long way. And uh, what, what is liver and gallbladder support in layman's terms? Yeah, so uh, anything, the liver has phase one and phase two detoxification and things like milk thistle, sulfurophane, 
Um, there are supplements that are called dual phase optimizers, which simply means they're supporting phase one and phase two. Uh, and just so the listeners know, you know, if you've ever had an adverse reaction to a drug or medication, that's part of the cytochrome P450 system, which is your phase one detox system. And so liver support, you know, can be anything from glycine to glutathione to vitamin C to the B vitamins. Um, and then gallbladder support, I like to use Tudka, which is a really long name I'm not going to pronounce, but um, that helps with the production and secretion of bile. Um, or you can use ox bile directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, because the gallbladder is so responsible for um, creating bile that supporting it with an extra oomph can be helpful. Um, okay. Let's kind of segue. We talked, we kind of jumped into talking about treating uh, the gut. Uh, let's kind of like take a step back before getting to the point of even treating like foundationally diet is usually a way that most folks will approach like a taking care of their gut health. And there's so many ways of eating clean out there on Dr. Google can help guide you how to heal leaky gut or tell you about what keto is, et cetera. Like, and so people end up going down different rabbit holes and can find that they feel better maybe initially only to sometimes run into a roadblock and the diet's no longer working for them or et cetera. What's, what is an, a way that you guide your patients to approach their diet for a gut health optimization? I tell them if their restrictions that they're placing on themselves are more stressful than ingesting the actual food, then your, your nutrition plan is way too restrictive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not to get off too far off topic, but food sensitivity testing, a lot of it is unreliable and it's, you're going to be lit up like a Christmas tree if we just test you without optimizing the gut and then people just freak out even more. So I don't like to do it. Um, but if you work on healing the gut lining, optimizing the microbiome, improving stomach acid and enzyme levels and bile levels, then, um, you know, the gut will work much better. Mm -hmm. And so, um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So specifically from a nutrition perspective, like, okay, it's stressing me out to not eat uh, or drink my diet Coke I'm obsessed with. Like, so should I, that mean that I'm drinking my diet Coke that I have to have or like what, that what I would say, I would kind of put a hard stop to and say, no, you can't have diet Coke because the aspartame is going to damage your microbiome um, even further. Um, you know, if you want to drink it for the caffeine, pick molecular hydrogen instead. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that's actually healthy, uh, which for the listeners is just a supplement that helps boost mitochondrial energy production. But as far as diet goes, you know, if you, you already have an imbalance, say an infection or a pathogen or low secretory IgA or low stomach acid, diet alone will not correct it. Diet can facilitate it, but as a monotherapy, um, you know, I think even we'll tell you that it's not going to get rid of, you know, gut pathogens. Now, you're exactly right. You know, you have to eat, you know, plenty of polyphenols and various antioxidants um, to support the microbiome that work along with the prebiotics, I guess the synbiotics. Um, but uh, yeah, those are, I would say, my answers in regards to nutrition, because um, a lot of times, for example, with intermittent fasting, um, people feel better from it and they think it's from the increased autophagy and uh, reversal of immune senescence, but it might just be they have leaky gut and a lot of food sensitivities and they're able to give their immune system a rest. Yeah, giving their body a little bit of a break. Well, that's all. It's all kind of maybe within a real foods context. If your food's stressing you out, like uh, just like thinking real foods abundance versus restriction. 
from a gut perspective. And then let's talk about the nuances. So I'm thinking of uh, clients, for example, that are eating whole real foods um, and yet still not feeling great. And maybe there is like some like uh, grain in the diet or um, even like lectin nightshade, like more autoimmune in nature, perhaps kind of presentation where they are reacting like an autoimmune type diet can feel restrictive. So how do you help an individual still get abundance uh, nutrients when they are only eating eight foods, for example, like that client that you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, in the short term, using things like supplemental essential amino acids to make sure they're getting those um, important building blocks, um, a broad spectrum blend of uh, antioxidants, um, you know, will be of tremendous help. But um, some foods, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, you can even, my mom's friend tested positive for lettuce. She cut out lettuce and over a month, she lost like 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there is some validity and there's, you know, an appropriate way to use those tests. But I would say um, in terms of nuances, the first thing you want to work on is healing the gut wall, the gut lining. So things that can do that are things like aloe, glutamine, zinc, carnosine, things of that nature. If you just start supplementing with something like HCL with pepsin, which is essentially replacement stomach acid, um, and you haven't healed the gut lining, then it's going to burn. And you're going to think, oh, I actually have too much acid, when in reality, that's very unlikely. And so healing the gut lining, optimizing stomach acid, because if you have pathogens and you have malabsorption and we go in and heal the gut lining, heal the pathogens, but we don't optimize your digestive chemistry, then the pathogens will likely return. So healing and sealing the gut wall, which we would call then leaky gut, kind of layman's terms, explain to people why they would get a leaky gut, what it is. And um, I mean, is it just a matter of taking supplements to heal it or what do you see? Yeah, so with the gut brain axis, 80% of the signals go from the gut to the brain but 20% go from the brain to the gut. And a lot of people say, oh, well, that 20% is not that important, but that 20% is extremely important. And if you had um, a rough childhood or high adverse childhood event score, um, there's a good chance you have low parasympathetic tone. So parasympathetic aspect of your nervous system is the rest and digest or the feed and breed aspect of your nervous system and uh, it controls all your internal organs. And in order for peristalsis or moving food throughout the digestive tract to work properly, your vagus nerve, which is one of the primary controllers of the parasympathetic nervous system, um, must be active. And so, you know, if it's a kid, um, usually I'll have their primary or their pediatrician right, for some oxytocin nasal spray. Um, that's kind of a hack that helps with behavior, socialization, and improving um, vagal tone. That's really a great point. And I like how you talk about, yeah, 80, the brain-gut connection is huge. Talk a little bit about leaky brain then and what that is. Yeah, so, you know, just like we have a barrier around many aspects of our body, we have a barrier around our brain. And things that can essentially punch holes in it are cytokines, which are just, you have pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. The ones that cause inflammation, they can punch holes in the brain and substances that should not be able to have access to the brain and central nervous system end up actually getting that access. And so um, you activate what's called microglial cells, which are an inflammatory cell type cell. And it's been shown in extreme cases to lead to things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and on a less extreme level, anxiety, depression, mood swings. Yeah, that's a huge reason. Even, yeah, anxiety, I would say. You see that yeah. commonly 
um, had a patient uh, the other day talking to me about even taking B vitamins. She was having some anxiety panic attacks and lo and behold, she actually does have SIBO as well. So her body's not absorbing and digesting and, and taking those B vitamins she's taking appropriately and therefore sending signals to the brain. Like it is causing more inflammation, stirring up a pot more than actually a getting benefits from those supplements. So just for the listeners to know that um, a reason why we can also react poorly to supplements goes back to like gut absorption and, or like the liver detox pathways as well, getting to optimize um, and utilize those nutrients. So absolutely. Anything else, uh, Dr. Tim, this has been a really great power hour on the gut. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I would say for the listeners, just, you know, I know that this time is especially stressful given what's going on in the world, but really, you know, when you think you don't have time for yourself, that's when you need it the most. And, you know, the best uh, way you can be of service to others is to optimize yourself. So Mm -hmm. don't forget that. I love that. Yeah. Put on your oxygen mask first, basically. Well, Tim, where can people find more about you and your work? Yeah. So my website is healyourbody.org, which is healyourbody.org. And um, I'm offering $50 off initial one hour consults if they use the code Dr. Lauren 24. So they can send me a message there and uh, use that code, Dr. Lauren 24, and I'll know where they came from. We'll definitely put that in the show notes. And Dr. Tim, thank you again so much for coming on. I love talking about the gut and the nuances to break some rules in the gut healing space. Absolutely. Thank (laughs) you so much, Dr. Lauren, for having me.